Joe, Joey Torts ready by telephone today. Joe, do we have you? I am here. Awesome. That's great. And in studio, we are joined now by Alonzo Perry in the Mike Carl seat. Alonzo, good morning to you. Good morning. Your shoulder is looking kind of kind of good over there. You might be able to hit the field. You know, what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's, you, you look good. Be yeah. careful, Alonzo. Be careful. Don't go too far down this path. <laughs> He's an old man. I think you still got the eligibility? You got some, I do. Yeah, I got the eligibility. I did not use up all of my five seasons of eligibility when I was eligible. See, was that your yeah. choice or the coach's choice? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that I quit before they could fire me. How's that <laughs> John Doyle is in the Larry Schultz seat. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning, everybody. And uh, if you missed the first segment of the program, this is indeed the actual college jersey from my playing day at Duquesne. <laughs> I don't call them days. Uh, I did play my freshman year, and I got in two games. I got in two games. Who'd you play? Who, who's with the, who were you playing the two games you got in? Um, I got in against, uh, I think it was St. Francis... And, of PA, yeah. yeah and uh, Mercyhurst. Oh, okay. I think it was. And that's when they both they were Division Three, right? Yes, we were all yeah. we were all playing Division Three ball back before the ND, NCAA said if you've got a Division One basketball program, you've got to come up yeah. with a football program. Yeah, Rob, yeah. what are the odds that the coach Duquesne will call you this tomorrow and say we need you on the field <laughs> against WVU? Keep in mind that the coach I had forty years ago is now dead, so he's not <laughs> but, but, but he calls that's a different yeah, story. But your le- yeah, but your legacy holds on. They obviously they know your skills your talent oh, who so that transcends all yes. generations yeah yeah <laughs> uh. so so i may watch the game just see if yeah. rob mario comes in as a pick, as a what pick, pick your feet up people <laughs> <laughs> i needed an excuse to wear this i never again i never would have thought you came was uh, playing wvu at a football game that's wild to me before, before you yes. go, uh, this is Joe Ferretti. Uh, before we got on, Joe, uh, Rob said, now you got to get your naps in early because once you hear the introductions, you're going to be geared for the day. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear these introductions. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> Ferretti's scared. He's, he is scared. I am, and I don't I need gen- him because I know all you people. <laughs> I, am, I am genuinely scared because uh, I was on the phone with Mike Hornby a week ago when information was being gathered. I was about two glasses of wine into the evening, and I did some things I'm probably going to regret. <laughs> I, hope there, I hope there's pictures this uh, this week as well. There are good pictures. There's a good picture last week. Yeah. yeah we're... <laughs> and we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right, we start off first with Alonzo Perry. He even refers to himself now as the Friday Crew's sixth man. And we do try to get him his minutes, at least the best that we can. When he's not out with the working man ordering a shot with a beer chaser, he's right here rowing like that lion on the island of Misfit Toys, King Moon Racer. (laughs) Well, if Mike Carl is out, then it means this guy is in. And we get that unmistakable Trump loyal Alonzo Perry grin. (laughs) Good morning, Alonzo. Morning, Trump 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet and laid back ain't the two words most would associate with this guy. And until very recently, I wouldn't have used them on him either. No lie. But that was until a recent show when he arrived half asleep <laughs> and blamed it on his lack of coffee as to why he barely uttered a peep. I wouldn't have believed it myself if it wasn't something I'd personally seen. And you ain't seen nothing until you've experienced John Doyle without caffeine. (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) Joe, Uh, you're hired. (laughs) I need you. (laughs) The interim session begins Sunday in the center of the states, and Republicans will be in Charleston, hopefully with a more manageable slate. Last time they got together, the governor fed them 45 separate bills, and that led to some serious lobbying from 45 different shills. If you recall correctly, there was one man who rejected that plan and did it with spite. You know him as the Badger, the Porn Sash Cuddle Bear. That'll get my kite. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> now, sometimes material presents itself that just cannot be ignored. That was uh, Ferretti with the sigh right there because I think in his heart, Joe knows exactly what's coming here. So. 
Joe, I ask you to enjoy, relax, find some video somewhere. <laughs> and I ask our producer, Colin McLaughlin, to please bring up the Joe Peretti photo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, oh yeah, baby. <laughs> sometimes in our past, we make mistakes that were caused by being in a hurry. And sometimes those mistakes are memorialized in a photo, even if it's blurry. <laughs> well, it just so happens that we have that evidence and we're about to show it. And Colin bringing it up on our screen, now you two know it. At one time, our next panelist was considered for a role in a movie he would soon mourn. And this is Joe Ferretti's audition shot. Apparently back when he was doing softcore porn. <laughs> you, you, you're right, Joe. <laughs> is, that, is that David Hasselhoff? <laughs> you know the shorter version of David Hasselhoff. You know, as a tribute to Joe, Bill, if you don't mind, I'd like to keep his music up for you as we do your intro. <laughs> Not if it's like what Joe, you just show Joe. <laughs> it's okay to laugh at Joe. I don't want to be the target. <laughs> well, I like Barry White enough to keep it up, though, so I'll just leave it up here for you, too. He's uh, usually interpreting the King's English three days a week. And that, for our audience, is usually enough chance to hear him speak. But this week, the Labor Day Monday reduced his week by one. And that reduced his presence and cut back on our Monday fun. I kid my friend Bill Stubblefield, and he takes it like a man, smiling graciously at the jokes as only the Admiral can. But truth be told, he's on a roll lately, pronouncing words from all over the map. <laughs> Which is about as unsettling for me as when the doctor says, Mario, grab that table. And then you hear that latex glove snap. <laughs> 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 a sweet comparison. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, if you'd like to continue, we can go on with the show, or we can just close it up now while the FCC takes away our license and <laughs> ends our softcore porn show here live on the program here. Uh, Joe, we would like to use your softcore porn photo for when you're on doing your points today if you have no objections. Uh I, uh, I strenuously object. <laughs> I, I, I now have to take a call from my business partners on the other lot. <laughs> it's it's uh, over, not overruled. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, it's, it's probably not your business partner you, you, you need to be worried about. It. It's your clients. <laughs> I, I think it's his wife he needs to be worried about. Uh, call, okay, Colin, you can bring can up I this. Proceed? You can you can bring up the suit and tie, Joe Ferretti. We gave him enough grief. So. Yeah, yeah. Call them, please. Issue number one, we go to Joe, our leadoff hitter, Joey Toits Ferretti. Go, Joe. All right. Um, well, let me compose myself here. All right. Um, so, uh, some recent polling came out about West Virginia public schools, which uh, really, really raised a question in my mind going forward for the state of West Virginia. The polling really was just done by – it was by Rex Repass, who has uh, – a reputation in the state of West Virginia and elsewhere of being a pretty fair polar. So uh, these results really were gain, or aimed at trying to figure out what does the public think about the state of West Virginia public schools and the performance levels of those schools. And, and I'm, I would imagine the polling was designed to get to a lot of parents to get their input. Well, the results came in, and I don't think they're surprising that – uh, 54% thought that the West Virginia public schools were performing about the same as they uh, have traditionally. 10% thought they were performing better. 36% thought they were performing worse. So if you look at the numbers uh, in the aggregate, 90% of poll respondents thought that the schools were either doing about the same or worse in the state of West Virginia. Now, this comes on the heels of some performance testing that was done a year ago, the NAEP testing, and we're, we're all familiar with those results. They were very poor. In fact, West Virginia's test results were the worst we have posted ever for math and reading at grade levels four and eight. And, of course, nationally, we're trailing national averages. 
So I, I thought, okay, what were the solutions to some of these uh, these concerns? We've we've you know talked about them endlessly on the show, but the polling come up with some solutions too. And the one solution that received the highest rating was pay teachers more, coming in at fifty seven percent. And again, this is coming from parents and taxpayers in the state of West Virginia. 47% thought more technology in the classroom and 35% said uh, reduced class sizes. So I know what we're going to hear from a lot of our elected officials. Hey, we've got, we've passed four pay raises for our teachers and we've established charter schools and the hope scholarship. So we're doing things to give parents choice and to pay teachers more. My concern is that the attitude might be prevailing amongst our public policy uh, folks that we've we've done what we needed to do. We've accomplished our goals, and it's time to move on to other pressing issues in the state. I submit we have not solved the problem. It is an ever-present problem that's going to require legislative action and attention every year to rectify the problems with our public schools. Even though we have four pay raises, we are still last in pay for teachers in the nation. So I think the job remains for the legislature to tackle this problem, and I'm hopeful that the attitude is not prevailing, that we've done everything we need to do. I hope the attitude is there's much more to do on this subject, and I'm just wondering what everybody else thinks about that. We have a delegate in-house. Let's go to him right now, Michael Height. So I, I, I'm not against giving teachers uh, additional money and, and trying to get them up to, to uh, you know, an average, a national average. Um, but I think there has to be some kind of locality pay in there um, that teachers across the state, um, especially in the southern part of the state, um, don't need as much as the, the teachers here in the eastern panhandle because of the cost of living, and, and in particular housing. Um, so I, while I think the teachers need more money, I don't think it's a statewide issue. And I, I don't know that the, the student scores are a teacher pay issue either. I, I think that there's a, a disconnect there. I don't know why the, the polls turned out that way, but they did. Um, that if there's a teacher teaching reading or math, if you give them another $5,000 a year, they're, they're not going to change the way they teach reading or math. They're going to teach it the same way. Now, I, I will agree that if you, if you pay more, you may have more teachers, and therefore your class size um, is reduced somewhat, and that may help. Um, but I don't see how raising pay is going to change how teachers teach. So I don't know that I, I agree with the, the way the polls came out in that regard. John Doyle. Um, the, uh, I do agree. Uh, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a clear connection. If we're dead last in teacher pay and we're dead last in, uh, in, in the fact that uh, uh, we have the lowest percentage of people in the country that have had any college at all, and I, I think there's a direct connection between uh, what, what the kids experience in, cool, in school and their desire then to go to college. There are all kinds of connections here. If we do have higher pay, the teachers we have will stay longer. We tend to lose our better ones to neighboring states. And Mike, I agree with you, we need locality pay. That needs to be part of it. But I disagree that there isn't a problem elsewhere in the state. There is. Uh, I think it needs to be in two steps. And we don't have to be at the national average. Uh, somewhere about halfway between dead last and 25th, uh, particularly if there's a factor in for locality pay, will, I think, uh, solve the problem. And in terms of, I, I know that uh, Joe mentioned school choice. I would like to see a poll that uh, that says, given your choice. Now, I, I, now, first of all, I think if you ask just a question uh, of the public, do you prefer school choice? I think the answer would come back. A majority would say yes. If you then, if instead ask a different question, do you think we need better better pay for teachers in the public schools? I think the answer would come back yes. I've yet to see a poll that says if you had to choose, would you would you 
approve higher teacher pay in the public schools or school choice. I believe a majority of the public would say the first. Better pay for teachers in the public schools because I think the public cares more about good public schools than they do about school choice. Mr. Perry. So, first, we can say that uh, we're last in teacher pay, but we're not last in per-pupil funding. So what we're experiencing, because, I mean, we're about middle of the pack, I want to say, when it comes to actual per pupil uh, school funding for the kids, is we're experiencing Gammon's Law, which is the theory of bureaucratic displacement, you know, where an increase in expenditures produces a, a lower yield in output. And so what we're seeing is the quality of education is declining. And I think that that's what the parents are actually bringing in their concern. And I don't think that um, it, it's totally and and completely in regard to whether or not we pay our teachers higher or lower um, that's going to mitigate the actual quality of education. There is some truth that if we pay teachers more, we will be able to recruit better teachers. I I, I think that that's a, a truism. But there's got to be some other instances in our education that we're looking at that's providing a lower yield in actual producing a student that's doing well in math and reading and uh, excelling in in some of those regards. And I only say that because I want to see, you know, some of the southern counties where the teacher pay is some of the highest in their region. Why aren't they performing better than because their teachers are being paid uh, greater in their area to pretty much any other profession. Um, The numbers just don't show that. So there's something else going on here. I think that we need to look at um, improving the quality of education. And I think school choice is the answer simply because uh, over time, we will see schools developing that are in direct competition with the public school apparatus. And uh, by then, we will see, you know, people will say, Uh, Maybe the models that these schools that are popping up are providing a better yield than the ones that are, you know, existing in public school. And we're giving the taxpayer uh, the opportunity to take that money and put it where they want their child to go. And I think that that's going to produce. But that takes time. That takes, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Billy? Yeah. uh, The interest in going into uh, public education uh, has dropped 50% since the early 1900s. It's the early 1990s, rather. It is the lowest level it's been in 50 years. So if you look at it, it's bad today. It's going to be even worse if this trend continues. Uh, The study went on to indicate a couple of things. Uh, There's probably no silver bullet, but one that says reestablish public education as an honored profession. That is great, but that's aspirational. How are you going to make that happen? Just because it's on a piece of paper is not going to make it happen. Uh, And it goes on to say one of the ways to make this happen is for teachers to be treated and paid as professionals. Uh, During when they got the last pay hike, uh, from my perspective on the outside looking in, the teachers did everything except on bended knee with a plate in front of them. They had to literally beg to get attention for that pay raise. They finally got some, uh, but it but they had to, uh, I think, uh, uh, project themselves uh, in a in a less than professional way because they were they literally had to beg for the recognition. Locality pay is something we should do, uh, but it's also a crutch we hide we we hide behind too much. I hope we do get locality pay, but in no way should we wait until we get locality pay to start treating the teachers both both uh, in a professional manner, and that means pay as they deserve. We should not be the 50th in the country. And more important, to treat them as professionals, which we used to, they used to be viewed as professionals, now less so today. And I think that's, that is a cultural change that is long, is long overdue. Back to you, Joe. Well, a couple things. Uh, to address Mike Heights' uh, comments about pay, uh, I think the pay is going to have to continue to be raised. We're, we're short 1,700 certified teachers by uh, the most recent data I've seen. And the only way you're going to compete with other states and get teachers to come to West Virginia teachers is offer them more pay. 
Uh, if we've got children who are being instructed by non-certified teachers uh, who are not certified to teach the subjects that they are covering in school, that that is a recipe for poor performance. So I think pay is is uh, clearly linked to solving one of those problems there. The argument uh, that Alonzo raises about uh, the, the school choice and having the charter schools and, and really having a parallel path for academics in West Virginia. Well, I'm a big supporter of that. And, I, and for my own child, uh, I, I chose private schooling for one of my children uh, myself. I, I don't see how that's going to uh, positively affect public school performance because the public schools are not in many ways subject to competitive forces. Uh, teachers don't get paid more if they do well. Uh, teachers don't get promoted by and large if they perform well compared to their, their counterparts in the private school setting. It's not, you know, in many respects, public schools are not subject to market forces. So I don't, follow the argument that creating a parallel path for academics is going to suddenly make public schools perform better. I think what teachers look at is opportunity to make more money and to advance themselves in terms of their financial packages or retirement packages. And, and frankly, if some of the private schools offer better choices in that regard, that's where the public school teachers are going to go. So I fear that we may be shortchanging our public schools not only in terms of, of things we've done in education in West Virginia, you know, from, from a view from 30,000 feet, but also I get the sense that there is a, a sort of a, a feeling of accomplishment with our public policy folks that they have done these things already. They've raised money, uh, raised pay for teachers, and they have fixed PEIA, and now it's time to move on. And clearly I don't think that's the case, and I hope that they just recognize that there's much more work to do. Well, Joe, let me clarify a little bit. because It's not that I'm against paying teachers more, because I'm not. I, I, I think they need to make more money. However, I don't think that paying teachers more is a fix-all. If you talk to teachers, a lot of them are getting out of the profession because because they're like Bill says, they're not being treated like professionals. There's a lack of respect, a lack of respect from parents, a lack of respect from the administration, a lack of respect from the Board of Education, even at the state level. And I think that's why a lot of them are getting out of the profession because of that lack of respect. So we have to sort of change our culture and how we look at teachers. And we also yeah. need to have teachers become less activists. Um, they, they've gotten the teaching profession a lot of times has gotten to to be very involved in, in the political atmosphere and and parents don't like that. They want you there to to teach subjects, teach math, teach reading and and keep your political opinions to yourself. I'll I'll teach my kids about politics. So there's there's two cultural things going on there. So, you know, I think you have to take all these into consideration. Mike, the, That's fair point. But, yeah, but Mike, you, the, you have described a national problem, and I think Bill did too, sure. to a very great, th this lack of respect for teachers and, and a resulting lack of interest in the part of people in being teachers. But that doesn't explain why the situation is worse in West Virginia than everywhere else. And fair I, point. I want to point out too that with Joe, you know, you had said that they uh, public schools are not, uh, subject to certain market, you know, forces, and um, there's not private solutions that are able to be implemented in schools. And you know, whether or not we want there to be, there are incentives that have been created in you know the the teaching profession. Um, whether those incentives are positive ones or reflect you know uh, just the the inefficiencies of certain government entities, or if it's you know uh, whatever they may be the incentives are still there and the incentives aren't producing what we wish to see in education. So uh, I, I think that that is some shortcomings and there needs to be innovation that actually reaches schools. Do When you do a study about the success or failure of public schools, does it largely rise and fall with the income level that the school is located in? Does the zip code determine the successfulness of a high school, a, a grade school or, or whatever, by and large, all things being equal in terms of who the principal is and, and whatever. 
Well, yeah, because this is a reflection of 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 the ability and desire of 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 uh, parents to participate in their school's education. This is uh, it is much more difficult for someone who a, a, a single parent who has three jobs to sit down with their their child at night and and go through the math problems and the reading problems and that sort of thing. Yeah, they're they're but but again, Rob, this is a national problem. I, I'm this, not, I'm yeah. asking as in general across the country. Yes, just, that's true. So so that that's a setup to say then then in effect, are we not trying to fix a public school model that was doomed to fail from the beginning, based on going to the school that's in your zip code? Again, that doesn't explain why it's worse in West Virginia than everywhere else. Well, it's an overwhelmingly poor state, too, though. But we're not. Ah, but there are other poor states that have uh, have improved considerably and, and their performances are much better. Uh, in Maine and Mississippi and other states like ours, small states with with uh, with struggling economies have done a much better job than we have. Then are we studying what they've done to try to model it? To improve it, well, they've they've got higher salaries than we do. Mm-hmm. Well, that just simply can't be the answer. But it's part of it. That's the point. It is much. I think it's a significant part of the answer. And no, it's not all of it. And I'll agree with Alonzo on this. Uh, much of the problem is that a much higher percentage of the money the state puts into education in West Virginia does not find its way into the classroom. Uh, there, we lose a lot yes. administratively. That needs to be part of the fix. We've been saying that for years. But, but yeah, but that is a source of higher pay for teachers. We also have centralized authority here in the state of West Virginia. You don't see that in other states. That you see, it's more localized. The authority of how to run a a school system. Um, if you look in in Massachusetts, New Jersey, some of these places that that have much better systems, it's it's not centralized. That's like correct, Mike. Virginia. There's there's only one state with more centralization. That is Hawaii that has one statewide school district. But that comes back to the point we've made frequently. It's better for the administration to be as close to the uh, to the population, to the folks as possibly oh, it yeah. can be. But, if so, you, if but you, that's the legislature. The legislators can take action on that and decentralize. We, we but if you, go on, if you go on local control, you probably also then need to go on local funding, which, is in, yes. which, involves, yes. which involves your property taxes in your school district paying for your teachers and your administration. And if you did that in West Virginia, how many counties would be doomed to fail because of no real appreciative tax base? Unless you put had more authority for local taxation, there's there's a proposal for an additional one cent sales tax for counties. Maybe you could give that to school boards too. I think if if there was a way to do it, it would have to combine a few counties. Uh, I don't think that there would be. Some places, like you said, would not be sufficient on their own, it, it, and that would look discriminatory. And we know that that wouldn't even get passed if there were some type of you know legislation that was developed like that. Uh, but it's it's something to think about because socioeconomics is an indicator of how mm-hmm. that school is going to perform. It's it's a reality, and so there's only trade-offs here there's no real smoke and gun solution there's you know uh things that we can do to try to mitigate the harm here and and try to improve education's outcomes but um we're we're in a tough spot and i think you know it's somewhere that we'd have to tread lightly in uh making sure that we don't create a bigger problem on that note we've got to end this discussion as we are over time by four minutes already which uh, cuts into the admiral's time when we come back bill you got to go four minutes shorter sorry this segment of our do. show is, yeah. be, is brought to you in part by Skinner. I'm going to take out with some Joe uh, Ferretti music here, too, by the way, if you didn't get enough of that the first time. Um, welcome back. Our uh, crew from the uh, first hour here we have in studio Delegate Michael Hyde. Good morning again, sir. Good morning, sir. Alonzo Perry in the Mike Carl chair. Good morning. I'm waiting for your <laughs> Waiting for the acknowledgement. The Admiral Bill Stubblefield, you're still here, Bill? I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> An off-camera joke <laughs> that, that went against my kite and myself. Now we get John Doyle. So wonderful to have you, John. Thank you for having me. Please come back soon. <laughs> In the place of the height of Stubblefield. <laughs> and that softcore porn god known as Joe Joey <laughs> Yeah, I prefer Joey Torch. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't everybody at some point along the way? <laughs> Half expecting you to show up in a Mark Wahlberg, Burt Reynolds movie at some point along the way here. Uh, let that circulate around the room. 
All right. Uh, oh, before I go forward, I promised I would uh, make this announcement here. They at the uh, rescue mission, they're hiring. They need a case manager at Haven House in uh, Martinsburg and a case manager at Hope House in Berkeley Springs, as well as a shelter attendant and also a shelter attendant at Haven House in Martinsburg. Go to martinsburgunionrescuemission.com to apply today. And Pastor Tim Garino and the great work he does there at the rescue mission. With issue number two, let's go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Before I go with my issue, a public service announcement, the Burke Community Pride will be holding their paper collection at Quad Graphics uh, tomorrow morning. I'm sorry, Bill, that wasn't on my sheet. Uh, I'm going to have to have you take that one back. (laughs) (laughs) Just send him an invoice. (laughs) I like Alonzo. He's profit-centric. Come on, Alonzo. (laughs) He is profit-centric. Okay. Well, I started to go with some esoteric issues such as... Is, is the moon actually made of blue cheese, or, <laughs> or should, or should Mike Hike be our presidential candidate? Both of which uh, I think would get a lot of a, a lot of discussion. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to go something much closer to home, and uh, and that's the situation with West Virginia University, uh, with Gordon G. Uh, if you've looked at the paper or listened to any news the last few days, this has been front and center. And it's a, uh, uh, and it's interesting in a couple of a uh, couple of facets. One, there was a, uh, the faculty voted nearly 800 to 100, 8 to 1 ratio that Gordon G, uh, no vote of confidence for the president, uh, Gordon G. Uh, the students uh, did followed up very very shortly thereafter and basically echoed the same concern on the flip side uh governor uh, justice has waited in uh our the president of the senate craig blair has waited in in very much support of gordon g uh the uh, board of governors who's going to ultimately make the decision have said that they have his full confidence and that was right after the uh, uh the faculty's no vote of confidence uh, I suspect Gordon G's job is not in jeopardy uh, because of the positions taken by the Board of Governors, but it has cast a very, I think, a very strong light on West Virginia University, which is a flagship, and flagship carries not only recognition but responsibility. The question to my colleagues is has West Virginia University been tarnished and Gordon G's administration been tarnished in the short term long term I think everybody's going to survive but in the short term is it G or G by the G, way? probably G I'm sorry so I, I'll, it's G. G, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. you'll have to modify your uh, your introduction in the future. Bill, I will go back and edit. This will all be cleaned up, so anybody who's listening to this program later will not even know. Okay. All right. Let's start first with Joe. Joey Torts for ready. Well, yeah, I think they've taken a black eye, and it's uh, much to I think every West Virginian's dismay that that has taken place because it is the flagship university. Uh, it is, uh, you know, with all apologies to the Marshall grads uh, in the local area, uh, you know, West Virginia University has long been considered at the, 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 the top of, in terms of, uh, you know, a university institution. And, and I'm not saying in terms of academics. I'm just saying that in terms of, of, of what it means to the state of West Virginia. It produces more grads, more people uh, graduate from there, work, and stay in West Virginia. They have a, a large alumni association many influential alumni. So it's, it is a black eye to have your faculty Senate vote eight to one and no confidence in, the, in Gordon Gee's administra- administration. But he's not going anywhere. Uh, the, the Board of Governors just extended his contract three weeks ago to, I believe, 2025. So, you know, that, that's – he's the horse they're going to ride for the next few years unless they're, they're going to consider now suddenly to reverse course and buy him out. Uh, and, and it's it's a problem for the university because uh, the reputation is, and this is nationwide now, this has been covered by the Wall Street Journal and other national publications, uh, they're cutting programs, they're cutting degrees, they're furloughing teachers and, and, administ- and some administrators, maybe not as many as, as perhaps they should, but bottom line is uh, this is not a lot of positive vibes coming out of Morgantown. So uh, it, it is a problem that has to be rectified, but... The person who's going to rectify it is Gordon Gee because he just signed a new contract. Alonzo Perry. So, I mean, there's some kind of uh, – there's an appearance here 
of you know a lot of like elitism there's a you know a, a semblance that like the cuts that are being made aren't being made with any kind of you know like they're it, they're indiscriminate and it doesn't have a, a formula or I, like I don't know what President G is or Guy is looking at, but just from the way that the cuts have came down, it doesn't seem that it's following any logical pattern, that it's doing anything that will um, erase, erase any of his uh, profitability from this. It just there's something there there's something wrong here. I'm not sure exactly what it is, and I think that you know with the teachers and stuff, it does it has created a stain. Um, on the image of you know this university and how they're navigating this kind of tough time here. Um, not to say that there aren't cuts that need to be made. Um, so I would love to see you know uh, President Guy actually talk to the community and tell us you know what is he looking at? How is he you know uh, going about you know this um, tough period and and why is the Board of Governors actually you know standing behind him and. Uh, you know, maybe that'll clear up some of this appearance, you know. John Doyle. Um, there are two problems here. First, there is a system-wide problem of higher education in West Virginia and its lack of money. Over the last 20 years, most states have reduced uh, taxpayer funding for public higher education. West Virginia has reduced it much more than most. Uh, I know that in the last couple of years, there have been some tiny increases, but even when you factor those in, we have still, over that 20-year period, cut public funding for higher education much more than most other states. Uh, so all of the institutions of higher learning are, are, are attempting to streamline. Most of them seem to be able to be doing it simply by that streamlining. You combine a couple of departments into one, and you do some administrative cuts, and you're able to basically have your same institution. This is not happening at WVU, and it's not happening at WVU, in my opinion, because when Gordon Gee came back for his second time around eight years ago, he made a presumption which was seriously incorrect, and that is that he could build that institution from, a, from an institution of an enrollment of 29,000 up to an enrollment of 40,000, and that was just plain stupid. And many of the decisions made in Morgantown were with that in mind, and for that reason, I think Gordon Gee should be fired. Now, I agree it's not going to happen, at least not right now. But I think it should. Michael Height. I agree with what some of John is saying. Um, there was there was some expansion trying to go on in, in a lot of, not just WVU, but a lot of, of you know, colleges and universities when enrollment was decreasing, which just didn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and that's why they've gotten into the, the situation that they are now, in addition with a lot of the states reducing funding for higher education. Now, the vote of no confidence doesn't surprise me at all because the sac the faculty senate is upset with the programs going away but gordon gee was given a a task that was very very difficult when you have a 45 million dollar deficit and you have to find ways to cut to to make your budget you know balance out he was given a very, very tough task. And now that he's making those tough decisions, that's why he's getting the vote of, of no confidence. But these decisions had to be made. I don't care if it was Gordon Gee or if it was somebody else. These decisions had to be made. So if it hadn't been Gordon Gee, they, it would have been somebody else they would have given the, the vote of no confidence to because the cuts had to be made. So whoever was in charge at the time was going to get a vote of no confidence because cuts had to be made. He took the, the hard stance. He's doing the cuts. He's doing the hard job of making those cuts. He's not going anywhere. I think that's why the Board of Governors is behind him. They also knew that these cuts had to be made, and he's just at the forefront of it and, and getting all the blame, if you will. Uh, and you're right. He's not going anywhere. He, he got an extension to 2025. I think he's around to at least then. So, mm. you know. I, I don't think he should be fired for making those cuts. I think he should be fired for the decisions he made four or five years ago, which resulted in the cuts being necessary. 
Well, yeah, I, he he had a positive yeah, outlook. He thought he could he could raise enrollment. He was wrong. I mean, should he be fired for that? Well, you know, that's yeah. Who, who knew a pandemic? Who knew a pandemic was well, coming? You're absolutely except right. Except for the Chinese who created it. Am I right? Huh? Yeah. No, but every school, <laughs> yeah. Rob, every school had to deal with those things. Yeah. And most of them seem to be able to figure out a way to doing it without cannibalizing the institution. Well, and here we come back to West Virginia again then, John. Same with the public schools, right? But, but wait, No, no, no. This is the only institution in West Virginia which is pr- pr- proposed to solve the problem by essentially cannibalizing offerings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The rest of them are doing administrative changes. Or closing altogether. Back like to you, Bill. Yeah. That's that, a private school. That yeah, doesn't count. That, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the kids who go there, John. No, 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 no. no. For the legislature and the, gov- and the government, that doesn't yeah. apply. We're talking about public higher education here. The former delegate John Doyle says AB <laughs> students don't count. <laughs> the students- he voted to close Alderson Broadus. <laughs> no, the legislature can't close Alderson Broadus. You it's can't a private trust school. John Doyle with your students. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yield my I'm, time I'm, to John. I'm, I'm, no, I'm looking at that that uh, phrase "Iron Dukes" on the front of his shirt, yeah. and 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 the score uh, this weekend is going to reflect uh, the intelligence of his comment. <laughs> John Doyle hates Duquesne University. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield, final word is well, it's I, private too. I had a couple of good final words, but I've lost them all with the salad. Yeah, going back to John's point. Uh, uh, Marshall University was faced with the ch- uh, same challenges that WBU was. Uh, that was the decline in enrollment. Marshall took a very aggressive approach in both retention and recruitment. They are not finding the same level of difficulty that WVU. So I don't think it can be just say that because of COVID. Other schools had the same problems. A lot of the other schools have coped fairly well with it, and they're not suffering the same problem. The other thing, going back to uh, Alonzo's point about the uh, cuts been discriminatory, uh, supposedly, at least in the linguistic department, the cuts were done through an algorithm, and if you looked at it from a more ob- objective point of view with a human involvement, uh, they, you would have come up with a different result. So I think there's been some mistakes made by WBU, but I do not think it's going to in, impact the president's job. September 8, uh, 2023, 9.25 a.m., Bill correctly pronounced <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> However, he booted the three-letter last name of the WVU president. (laughs) (laughs) Issue number three, Delegate Michael Height. All right, so recent in the news is um, the Liberty Safe Company. So the Liberty Safe Company, will they face Bud Light-like boycott after providing FBI uh, the FBI with a private citizen's safe code. Now, to, to preface this, the, the, the private citizen we're talking about was under investigation for January 6th um, issues, and but Liberty Safe um, gave out the master code to li- all Liberty Safes, which I didn't know there was a master code, um, so that the FBI could go in and get into this gentleman's safe. Now, they did have a warrant to search the man's house, but they didn't have a warrant to Liberty Safe to to get a master code. So will they face a boycott like like uh, Bud Light did? Usually, I have three attorneys on staff for these kind of things. I only have one, so I'll start with him today and Joe Ferretti. Well, uh, Liberty Safe's uh, argument, uh, and I guess they reformed their their corporate policy now. They're saying they're going to require a court order before they turn over any master codes to anyone's private gun safe uh, a search warrant is a court order <laughs> so I, I don't know what they're talking about here but i mean you go to the court and apply for a search warrant and you get it upon a showing of probable cause that you have reason to search someone's private property their home now when they come in with a search warrant they go through your dresser drawers they go through your closets so as a matter of and as a technical matter i don't know if the search warrant embodied going into a private safe but, uh, yeah, Liberty, Liberty Safe Company has certainly uh, kicked the hornet's nest here because they did uh, willingly turn over the master code. And let me tell you, these, these companies have master codes for a reason. A lot of people forget their combinations, and then they can't get access to what's in the safe. 
when my father unexpectedly passed away, he had a gun safe, and nobody knew the, the code to get in the safe. And we had to resort to a master code from the manufacturer to do that. So the bottom line is there's a reason for master codes, but was there a compelling reason for Liberty Safe Company to turn over the master code in this instance? I don't know. I'd have to look at the search warrant and all it entailed before deciding whether the corporate response and providing that information was appropriate. Uh, but, yeah, they're going to take a black eye on this, and they're quickly going down the path of Bud Light. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Alonzo. Yeah, I, I think that it's actually a shame that they gave the FBI the uh, manufacturing code or the, to bypass the, the actual safe. Listen, it, the thing is, is that, you know, not even Apple will allow, you know, will give the encrypted data to allow, you know, the FBI and some of these agencies to go through your phones and, and, and certain things like that, even with, you know, uh, a lot of these documents that you're referring to. So it's just, it, it seems to me that, yes, there should be mass Bud Light level boycotts about, you know, a private citizen's right to, you know, uh, have some type of privacy. Um, Unless this is, you know, something that the search warrant directly writes uh, for, you know, there's something in this safe. We know that it's in this safe. You know, it, it, there's proper procedures for this type of event, and they weren't followed. That's where the uh, the actual issue comes into this matter. So they should be boycotted. I mean, that's that's the the root of the question here. And yes, I, I full heartedly agree with that. Billy? Yeah, I do not believe the, uh, it's ever going to raise the same level of visibility as Bud Light. Transgender was not involved in this case, and that was the, uh, the tripping point, I think, in a lot of the Bud Light. What to me is somewhat revealing and maybe disturbing is how we're viewing the FBI today. Uh, 20 years, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, when FBI was invoked, it was with a degree of respect, they're protecting us all. Now when FBI is invoked, it is at least a sizable portion of our community is they're the bad guys. We're weaponizing the bad guys. Uh, I just find it disturbing that, that an institution that I think is so critical in so many regards to our society is so is viewed as evil in today's time. John Doyle. Having never in my life owned a safe and having no plans to ever have one. I'm happy to join a boycott of any safe company <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> I had no idea you were just a joiner. You don't like safes, too? You don't like private schools and you don't like safes? John <laughs> Doyle hates, hates the fact that you keep your stuff safe. <laughs> But, I mean, even you have to write what's behind that safe that you think that you, so you can even collect it, you know, in a search warrant. This is uh, search warrants. The way they are written are so fine tooth combed. I mean, you know, when uh, a police go to write anything, they got to look at the house. They got to make sure that they have the description of the structure. They have to go write what they're looking for in the structure. And anything that's collected that's not supposed to be is uh, what is it? Fruit of the poisonous tree or that's yeah. the one fruit of the poisonous tree counselor yeah something, something like that i haven't gone to law I, school yet hey no but. no 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 I, uh, I i i watch law and order all the time <laughs> no difference at all Alonso, let me add Alonso. you can easily make a case for the search of the safe uh if the allegations against this one january 6th participant was for example that he was carrying a firearm in the confines of, of the district of columbia which could be illegal. Uh, then, and, and they identified perhaps uh, what kind of firearm it was. I can tell you the search warrant could encompass searching that safe to see if the man has that firearm that he was identified carrying in the District of Columbia during January 6th. But so you can imagine, and I have no information in this regard, but you can imagine there being a scenario where a search of that safe would be entirely appropriate. But why would Liberty Safe inject themselves into this scenario where this was between law enforcement, FBI, and a private citizen? It had nothing to do with Liberty Safe. You know, the 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 individual citizen, you know, if he served with a warrant, should 
have the option of of you know giving into the warrant and opening the safe himself without liberty safe coming in and giving it out a master code and if he doesn't open the safe then there there are laws that that he is in contempt and and we can do something about that but liberty safe should not inject themselves into law enforcement and private citizen issues all right that being yeah the- i agree I- as a, as a matter of corporate policy, Mike, I, I think you're correct. They, if they would have been smart about it, they would have uh, required more from the courts before they handed that information right. over. That's different but, if they I, get... But the bottom line is, it, it's easy to get the courts to uh, eventually require that of Liberty Safe. Right. That, so why didn't they wait for the courts to say, Liberty Safe, you have to turn over the master, and, and then they're covered? Mike Height, final word is yours, unless that was your final word. That was it. All right. In that case, we take our break here and on the clock, issue number four, John Doyle. Yes. um, Thank you. Uh, Initially, I was going to uh, talk about volleyball. Uh, The uh, U.S. national team is on its way to, uh, to the World Cup, the men's national team. And the big question was whether uh, George Santos, who, as we all know, uh, at least according to him, uh, was an All-America men's volleyball player at NYU. Uh, it, w- the question is, was he going to be eligible to play? And it was settled late last night. He is cleared to play. George Santos will be in the lineup when the uh, U.S. men's national volleyball team competes for the world championship. So with that done, uh, the Thank question... goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I was so worried about that. Yeah, well, I was too. Uh, the is, is Larry Schultz back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said he had a full ride as a men's volleyball player at NYU. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so you know, we just take him at his word. Um, at any rate, so I'll go, now go to a one with probably more national implications. It has. It has come to my mind, particularly it did watching uh, the recent uh, debate between uh, most of the or, or a significant portion of the Republicans who are running for president, that there is a significant similarity between Vivek Ramaswamy or Vivek Ramaswamy, I think he pronounces his name, and Andrew Yang, who w- was a Democrat who ran for president four years ago. And here it is. They're both uh, multimillionaires, maybe billionaires, who knows? I don't know, but then nobody needs to know. Uh, both uh, uh, achieve that status by being brilliant, high tech entrepreneurs. Uh, and both have come out with what I thought, think are some off the wall ideas uh, in their debates. Remember Andrew Yang saying we needed to have a guaranteed income of $12,000 for every American? Mm -hmm. Of course, he never said where the money was coming from. He just said we needed to have it. Uh, And now we have Vivek Ramaswamy basically saying that uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, whether Russia beats Ukraine. Uh, And there's some other stuff. So I just wanted to throw it out to the group. Uh, do you think there's something in the water in Silicon Valley <laughs> that produces candidates like this? Hmm. Well, well, that's an interesting discussion point. I know you're a big Vivek fan, Alonzo, so go right ahead. So I just want to put this on the net. I'm still voting for Trump, but I do <laughs> like, I like Vivek. I think Vivek is, is, is a breath of fresh air. I think that he is... Uh, he gets the message, and he's a bright guy that's going to see, you know, the future of the Republican Party is moving in uh, a good direction. Now, when it comes to Andrew Yang, I actually liked Andrew Yang, and his uh, plan for that guaranteed income, I think, was a terrible idea. I mean, even Ben Franklin says if you can vote people, you know, money directly, then that's the end of the republic, you know. But uh, what I did like about him was he came with creative ideas, and he talked about getting that 12000 from a value-added tax on tech industries. And, I mean, you know, Silicon Valley's not on my side, so if he was going to tax them to all, and, you know, by all means, you know, have fun with that. Um, but Alonzo the, Perry is in yeah. favor of higher taxes. <laughs> So, so. <laughs> he wants your iPhone to cost seven thousand dollars. <laughs> Do you really think he could have gotten that much money from just the high tech industry? I mean, these guys have pillaged our data, and this is something that we've never talked about either. Too, I feel like you know it should be a bigger conversation. How did these guys?
guys get rich other than by selling our information? If you know that belonged to us, that's our money. And you, you know? still like these two guys? Well, I love uh, Vivek, <laughs> and I think Vivek, like I said, you know, he brings a, a, a breath of fresh air. He has new ideas. They're they're approaching problems in ways that they haven't been approached. You know, and and sometimes we have to shrug ourselves of the orthodoxy to come up with the best possible idea. Uh, to, uh, to Alonzo, that, what you're saying about Vivek is some of the things I heard from some of my fairly far lefty friends about Andrew Yang. Yeah, I mean, creative, it, new ideas, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you got to think there is uh, a, a place for for wisdom and experience, and you know uh, that that matters, and that's why I don't think Vivek is quite ready to be mm -hmm. the president. But having him in a cabinet position, having him somewhere in the administration, and and coming up with some of these you know new approaches to the tried and true models that have you know got us to the points here you know you're, you're gonna have to mix it up you know Pred prediction if nikki haley gets elected president vivek will not be in the cabinet <laughs> i don't think nikki has a chance mike I um like andrew yang ramaswamy is a whack job and the, <laughs> the, more, the more he speaks the more that will become evident um he's fake He's not. He, he's he's like a lot of um, billionaire tech guys. They are very eccentric in a lot of ways, and they come up with these these weird ideas that that sound good on the surface, um, but in practicality, they just don't work. And the more he talks, um, the worse he sounds. Um, just like Andrew Yang, um, and and I think as the debates continue. And as the campaigns continue, he will fade off into the sunset, much like Andrew Yang did. Because um, people will see him for what he is, the whack job that, that he is. So, Billy? Yeah, I agree uh, totally with what Mike Hake said. I think uh, four years from now, uh, Ramasamy will be forgotten the same way Andrew Yang was. Uh, you had to go back to my, the far reaches of my memory to try to remember who Andrew Yang was, <laughs> what he was standing for. It's it's fate in the past. I think Ramasamy will be the same way. Uh, I think uh, part of anyone's success on the election trail is to appear reasonable and appear not only reasonable and likable. Ramasamy has not achieved either one of those yet. Joe Ferretti. Uh, well, when I watched the, the, the debate that was held uh, about three or four weeks ago, I was struck by the fact that all the attacks were directed at Vivek, which at least told me that the, the other folks on the stage there running for the highest office in the land thought he was the biggest threat, not Ron DeSantis. So I quickly went to, to research Vivek. I am really impressed with his achievements in the academic realm. Uh, this, this guy has studied hard. He has gone to the most rigorous institutions in the country and has performed admirably as a student uh, and professionally. Uh, he's a success story. Does it make him qualified to run the country? And uh, I, I kind of agree with Alonzo that uh, if there's a role for him in a public policy circle, it should be perhaps the head of education department or something like that if somebody else is elected president. I don't see him being our president, because I agree with the Badger here, uh, he, he's off the wall on too many things. Uh, he loses me when he starts talking about the World Trade Center uh, attacks being an inside job or government officials being on that. the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. He didn't He say loses that. me at that point. And, and I think that uh, there's a lot of things like that about him that would uh, probably disqualify him from, from office. But uh, I, you can't deny the achievements of the individual and and uh, there might be a role for him somewhere at some time go ahead alonzo he didn't say that the 9-11 uh, was an inside job he said that the commission report uh, was not entirely accurate 
and that has been maligned and, and contorted and you know just like what the media always does you said you if I said that the sky was blue you know they're gonna say that I said it was you know red or that blue's my favorite color and uh, am I racist because I think the sky's blue I mean like that's that's what the media that's what the media does so you know it, that's that's it, it, all he said and it was on a joke podcast. He was with Alex Stein, who's actually one of the speakers for um, our Eisenhower dinner. Shameless plug. plug. There. Yeah. And uh, he was on there and he asked him, was 9-11 an inside job? And he laughed and said, no, I don't believe it's an inside Or he said that I don't think the government has been entirely uh, uh, honest about what transpired in the commission report. And then that was taken and ran with. And now it's some quick jab to say he's a conspiracy theorist and he's a liar. And, uh, you know, this guy will go on MSNBC and actually argue with. Uh, people across the aisle. This guy will go on CNN. He's not afraid to talk to people. And because when you have a an increased volume of who you're talking to and and not shying away from it, you know, obviously there's going to be more points for them to to pick and prod at what you've said. Uh, he's released 20 years of his tax records. Of course, they're going to find you know uh, things within the scope of that that's going to you know make him seem like he's uh, a grifter or or something but it's because he's being honest and it's only to his detriment at this point which is really sad comes back to you john for the final point well i think uh, uh my con i've concluded that my original conclusion was probably right there's a great similarity between both of them uh, andrew yang and, and vivek ramaswamy all of these things that have been said about vivek could could have been said about andrew uh and to use the terminology of of mike height uh one's a whack job of the right another's a whack job of the left and vivek ramaswamy will not even try to run for mayor of new york and now we move on to issue number five, and that goes to Alonzo Perry. So just two weeks into West Virginia's 2023 high school football season, many people are questioning the new transfer portal rule. The backlash has come after a number of blowout games with some schools winning by 50 points or more. Athletes and parents have taken to social media, blaming the new rule which passed in the 2023 legislative session. As the law stands, high school athletes are now able to transfer to another school one time without being penalized and losing a year of eligibility. So my question to the panel is, should the legislature Legislature revisit the West Virginia transfer portal to make some type of carve outs preventing super teams and what people are are complaining about. All right, let me go to Joe Ferretti first on this one. Joe? Yeah, I, I, interesting subject. Um, I, I I look at some of these scores and it seems to me uh, what I've read that the transfer issue has hit the hardest in the Canal Valley. Uh, I actually talked to Colin Montgomery, our local sports expert, and uh, he, he tells me that he didn't think it was that much of an impact yet in the eastern panhandle. But in some of the counties in the Kanawha Valley, where there's a lot of schools you know, placed close together and transferring from one to another and traveling to a, 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 distant, or a school in the next district is not that cumbersome, I think transfers have taken hold there, and you're starting to see it. My gosh, uh, the the hurricane score of 93 to seven. It was 65 to nothing at halftime, and the Huntington score, which ended up 86 to nothing, it was 49 to nothing after the first quarter. I don't even know how that's possible, but uh, uh, I, I think some rumblings are coming out uh, from the Charleston area that transfers are at the root cause of this. It, it, kids and, and coaches have, have succumbed to some recruiting that's taken place at the high school level, and now we have a concentration of talent at certain schools. And uh, I, you can see the problem not getting better statewide. It perhaps might get worse. And I'm just wondering what we have wrought with this transfer rule, and then I think it deserves scrutiny as we go forward. John? Um the answer to uh, Alonzo's question is yes. Uh, we got to do something about it. But I want to caution my conservative friends. I believe this is just one manifestation of the idea of school choice. The idea that it is easier for uh, a, a, a parent or, 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 or a family to say, 
uh, we're going to send our, our child to uh, high school A as opposed to high school B. And it seems like it's it, 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 in terms of uh, of looking at at, at, at the whole uh, spectrum of education that I, I hear that for education reasons it's okay to do that, but now the problem is if it's done for athletic reasons, is that okay? Uh, I I think the the answer to Alonzo's question is yes. We need to stop this right now, but we also stop, need to stop and think about where is this coming from, Bill. Yeah, we tend to focus on athletics, but as uh, Ron Stevens said the other day, that it's an activity issue, and I think whatever we do, we need to treat it as a, the full spectrum and not just single out the football games or the basketball games. There's another approach, uh, and I, I – I am one hesitant to send everything to the legislators to fix something, even though they may have caused the problem. But the more we can do independent of the legislators, I think the better. Uh, you can do that by scheduling. It's just using the uh, uh, the Eastern Panhandle, for example. If we had Martinsburg, for example, uh, as a powerhouse beating everybody 99 to nothing, uh, it's easy. Uh, the uh, the Spring Mills, the uh, Hedgesville, the uh, uh, Musman, just don't schedule Martinsburg and let them steal their own juices, if you will. Uh, I just uh, uh, I just don't like the idea of sending everything back to the legislators to fix everything that we see in life today. Well, speaking of legislators, Mr. Height, you know I, I, you're getting blamed for this I, in I, Charleston, I, and and we should be. Um, you know, we, I, I asked this exact question when this was being debated, you know, how does this, what prevents super teams from happening? And I was always assured, you know, you, the people can transfer already. You know, there are kids that are now transferring before this law went into effect. There were kids transferring to other schools to play football or basketball or whatever. And that this, this wasn't going to cause super teams. This was just another thing of school choice. Um, and, you know, I reluctantly voted for it. So I'm sort of, um, I'm looking at things now and, and saying, you know, the, what I, I feared was going to happen, it looks like is happening and, you know, does it need to be revisited? Yes, but I'm not sure at this point how do you fix it. I mean, because this was, it wasn't about sports, this was about school choice and, and being able to take your kids to um, schools for educational choices, um, but rarely do you see the educational option being used it's usually about sports you know i want my kid to be able to go to this school and 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 here in the panhandle is a perfect example you know everybody wants to play for martinsburg because martinsburg has a a championship legacy and and everybody wants to be a part of that so you see a lot of that here and and it's not just martinsburg because if you're a baseball player, you may want to go to Jefferson or you may want to go to, to Hedgesville. Um, and, and if it's, you know, another sport, and you might want to go to somewhere else. If it's volleyball, you might want to go to Musselman. So you have to be careful when you open the doors like this. And I think maybe the legislation is open to Pandora's box, and I'm not sure how you close it. I want to, I want to jump in on this because I coach high school football. I'm an assistant coach. And tonight, weather permitting, I'll be doing that again. And there's some unwritten rules that you follow in any sport, and one of those is sportsmanship, okay? In 1916, I think it was, Georgia Tech beat Cumberland 222 to nothing. I think everybody looks back on that and says, that's bad sportsmanship. And if you read the game stories on that, it was terribly bad sportsmanship. It was a revenge game, mm -hmm. okay? I've seen David Walker take knees in the third quarter in games, to keep the score down. I've seen him punt on third, maybe even second down 15 years ago, 10 years ago in games that his team was clearly going to win in a wide margin because the other team wasn't com uh, competition. Okay. A uh, report is that there was one of the coaches involved in one of these 80 or 90 point games had the opportunity to play six minute quarters in the second half and said, no, we want to go the full 12 minutes. Mm. There are things you can do to keep a score down. Kids practice. They deserve the right to play. If you're the third string, whatever, you shouldn't have to go in and take a knee starting in the third quarter. I, I understand that. Those kids deserve to play. But if you got a chance to shorten the game to six minutes, if you got a chance for the running clock, you got to take that chance. you got to help to keep the score down somewhere. But, but Rob, uh, one of the co those coaches agreed to six-minute quarters I know. in the second half and still won by one of those big scores. I know. Uh, yeah. but, but what you got to do is – 
you got to roll that clock. It doesn't stop, and you get that thing over with in twelve minutes. And yeah, the, and and there's there's ways you can keep a score down in this particular situation. But by and large, I think this is an overreaction to the transfer rule. I think the transfer rule is a good rule, and I think it should be kept where it is. But, Rob, this has been a refreshing exposure. We have now a statewide issue that Mike Height has accepted full responsibility for. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Height beat your school 93 <laughs> to <laughs> Mike, every, every problem is because of Mike Height. <laughs> Actually, actually, I admire Mike for saying, "Hey, I might have made a mistake on this. Uh, I, I want to think about this." Yeah, it's a. Uh, you can't get everything right when you're in the legislature. Thank you, John. I appreciate. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Final thoughts together. Eight seconds apiece, unless Doyle runs long or Bill does. Final thoughts. We start with Joe Ferretti on the phone. Eight seconds, Joe. Go. The lowly Pirates took two or three from the Cardinals. Boy, do I miss Mike Carl this week. <laughs> John Doyle. Well, uh, the Nationals finally snapped their six-game uh, streak uh, day before yesterday and didn't have to play yesterday. I hope we've got the ship righted and can I said eight it. seconds. Bill <laughs> Stubblefield. Yeah. If you're outside this weekend, I hope you get wet. Yes. Eisenhower dinner next Saturday. Mr. Height. You got it, time now. Interims are this weekend. I hope we get something uh, uh, accomplished. Despite John Doyle's best efforts, I actually have time to give the ID. <laughs> <laughs> hey, have a great weekend. <laughs> Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV. Table Talk to get in 70 short hours. <laughs>